welcome back. In this video, I'll talk about some issues related to reliability and security. First, we'll look at ways to ensure that the data has not been corrupted. And this could be in two scenarios. One is that the data that was stored in memory is the same data that we later read from that location. And the other scenario is when the data is sent over the internet, we want to check if that is identical to the data received on the other end. The simplest and oldest technique is to have an extra parity bit. This parity bit is an extra bit used to detect errors. It works by counting the number of ones in a byte. Parity can be even or odd. For even parity, we'll set the parity bit so that the number of ones is even. For odd parity, we'll set the parity bit so that the number of ones is odd. The parity bit is written when the word is written or sent. And when that word is later read or received, the parity bit is checked to see if there was an error. Let's look at even parity. Let's say this is our byte. Notice that there are four ones here. So we would set the extra parity bit to zero so that there's still an even number of ones. But let's say this was our byte. This has five ones. We would set the extra parity bit to one now there are six ones, an even number. Similar thing for odd. If we have an even number of ones, we'll set the parity bit to one so that the number of ones is odd. And if the number of ones is already odd, we set that parity bit to zero. Parity can be used to detect a one-bit corruption of data, but it can't correct the data. In the next few slides, we'll look at an implementation of a Hamming error detection and correction code. This is named in honor of Richard Hamming, who received the ACM Turing Award in 1968. Like a lot of ideas in computer science, this is inspired by the field of information theory developed by Claude Shannon and others. The Hamming error detection code relies on what later came to be called the Hamming distance, the number of bits that are different between two bit patterns. For example, the distance between these two bit patterns is 2. The nice thing about the Hamming code that we'll look at is that it can not only detect an error, but correct it as well. This example from my book shows how single error correcting system would work. We're going to have extra parity bits that check the data bits. Normally, we always number our bits from right to left, starting at zero. This example is a little weird in that we're going to number our bits left to right, starting from one. So for an 8-bit byte, we have eight data bits. These are D1 through DA. And interspersed in there will be some parity bits. These are the bit positions that are at powers of 2. 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3. And these parity bits have a responsibility to check themselves with certain data bits. So notice that each data bit is being checked by at least two parity bits. That redundancy makes this work. So I put some data in a spreadsheet. Let's say this is our original data, 01010101. These are the data bits here. And I've set the four parity bits accordingly using even parity. For example, parity bit 1 has to check itself, data 1, data 2, data 4, data 5, and data 7. There are two ones there, that's even. So there's a zero in parity bit one. Parity bit four checks data two, data three, data four, and data eight. There are three ones there, so we need to put a one there to make this even parity. And so we see we encoded these 12 bits to represent the eight bits of our original data plus the parity. These 12 bits would be written to memory or sent over the internet. 
Now let's see what happened when we either later read that data or we receive it at the other end. And let's say there was a corruption in bit D4. D4 should have been a 1, it's a 0. When the parity bits are set, we can look at the parity bits and now they're 0, 1, 1, 1. That's 7, which is in the bit D4 location, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And that tells us that this bit is the one that was corrupted. So it can correct it by flipping that bit back to a 1, and now the data is fixed. Here's a picture comparing non-ECC RAM with ECC RAM. The error correcting code RAM will have an extra chip, so we see that there are 9 chips here compared to the 8 chips on the non-ECC RAM. And that extra chip is used for the error detection and correction for the other 8 chips that hold data. The advantage of ECC RAM is that we'll have a much lower fail rate, of course, but it requires a motherboard and CPU that support it, and those are typically more expensive. There are many different ECC algorithms, some of them based on the Hamming system that we've discussed, and more sophisticated approaches can be used in space applications where the system is much more susceptible to cosmic ray interference. It makes sense that a device deployed in space would be more susceptible to cosmic rays since the Earth's atmosphere is not there to provide some protection. DRAM errors are of two types. Soft errors occur when the device is fine functionally but had some random interference, maybe from cosmic rays. Hard errors reflect problems with the physical device for example, if a specific bit in DRAM is permanently stuck at 0 or 1. Now that we've talked a little bit about the reliability of memory, let's circle back to our discussion of virtual memory from an earlier video and talk about security issues. All of the running processes on a CPU are sharing the same physical memory, which has been divided into possibly overlapping portions of virtual memory. One scheme for protection is assigning protection keys. Each process would be assigned a key by the operating system, and each page of virtual memory has a key. When a process tries to access a page, the keys are checked. And we'll need hardware support for this operating system protection. We'll need a privilege supervisor mode, also called kernel mode, and privileged sets of instructions that only the operating system can execute we'll have to make sure that those page tables and other critical information are only accessible in supervisor mode and provide a means of an exception if something happens that shouldn't have. Obviously hardware designers and operating system designers have put a lot of thought into making systems secure. So what could go wrong? One thing is a side channel attack. Side channel refers to attacks external to the CPU implementation. Let's say some secret data like a password or encryption key was stored in the register file during execution, and a hacker wants to know what it is. Well, electronic devices emit electromagnetic information. And according to an article in a Wired magazine issue in 2015, a group of researchers at Tel Aviv University created a $300 gadget that fits inside a piece of pita bread and can derive the encryption keys on a nearby laptop's hard drive by picking up its electrical emissions. The ones and the zeros. When we were talking about cache in earlier videos, we talked about the cache coherence problem, where different cores in a CPU can have inconsistent values for a given memory location. The fix was a snooping protocol where the cores can listen into each other to determine what addresses each is accessing. And you might have wondered at that time if that's really a secure thing to do. Actually, there are several vulnerabilities known to exist in modern CPUs. These are called microarchitecture vulnerabilities because they exploit the architecture of all modern processors. Two examples are Meltdown and Spectre. Both Spectre and Meltdown trick a processor into temporarily accessing secret information and then encoding it 
in a processor's cache. And then forcing the processor to search for the information in memory, they can measure how quickly the chip accesses it, and a hacker can analyze the timing of the processor's response and learn what's in the cache and what's not. Attacks like Spectre and Meltdown forced Intel and other computer manufacturers to release software updates that can hide data that's exposed in some kind of side channel attack or pad it with other noise that makes it harder to decipher. Unfortunately, some of these patches and fixes make the processor slower. Of course, security and reliability issues can occur on more than just the machine in front of you. The next few slides will discuss virtual machines and cloud computing. You've probably used a virtual machine, something like VirtualBox or VMware. And the idea is that the host computer is going to emulate a guest operating system. This can isolate multiple guests and multiple operating systems and allows different environments to share the same physical resources. This virtualization will have a little bit of a performance impact and it's an idea that's been around for a really long time, going back to an IBM machine back in the 1970s. Virtual machines can be great ways to test out your application on different operating systems. A virtual machine will need a monitor or hypervisor that's in charge of mapping virtual resources to actual physical resources of the machine. The guest code will run on native machine and user mode, and it will trap to the virtual machine monitor on privilege instruction to protect the host resources. And this allows one physical machine to host many different guest operating systems. Amazon Web Services use virtual machines in the cloud. This enables them to protect users from each other. For the user, it can really simplify their software distribution and help their application scale up or scale down as needed. For Amazon, the advantage is that they could kill a virtual machine if needed to control resources, and they can monitor, control, and of course price based on usage. Another advantage for the user is that it would hide the server hardware details. Some experts estimate that by 2025, more than 85% of global organizations will be running containerized applications in production. One popular container application is Docker. If you have Docker running on your machine, you can have several different containers that compartmentalize the application and whatever infrastructure they need. These executable packages will include everything it needs to run, the code, the system tools, libraries, and settings. Let's say you're running a machine learning application that depends on importing a lot of libraries. You can incorporate all of that in the container and then just share the entire container with others. Another name you hear in this space is Kubernetes. This picture from their website puts what we're talking about into a nice graphic. On the left, we have traditional deployment. That's you running your application on a physical server. Problem is that one application might be taking up all the resources and harming the other applications. These problems led to virtualized deployment. This allows you to run multiple virtual machines on a single physical server CPU and providing a level of security as the information of one application can't be accessed by other applications. The next step in evolution was this container deployment. Containers are similar to virtual machines, but they're more lightweight, and they're easily portable across clouds and operating system distributions. The point of Kubernetes is just to manage containers. It can automate configuration and deployment. Google open sourced Kubernetes project in 2014 and it combines multiple years of Google's own experience running production workloads at scale. One slightly related option on a Windows computer, if you have Windows 10, is Ubuntu on Windows 10. This is a collaboration between the canonical Ubuntu people and Windows developers. It's not a separate boot and it's not a virtual machine or a container. It's actually an infrastructure within Windows that runs Ubuntu user mode image provided by Canonical. 
You can run bash scripts in there, Unix commands on Windows, and the nice thing is that the Unix commands will have access to your Windows file system, so you don't have to have a separate file system. It doesn't have a GUI, and it's not the full Ubuntu, but it's enough to get a lot of good things done when you need a Linux commands on a Windows computer. I have a link here if you want to find out more. If you're interested in these topics, they're really beyond the scope of our course, but you might look into online resources. There's a Safe Comp conference on computer safety, reliability, and security, so you can Google that. Most research conferences like this will publish their proceedings. I checked the UTD library and I saw that proceedings from previous years going way back are available online. Computer science is such a growing field that it really is impossible to keep up with all aspects of this enormous field, which is an entire universe. So you kind of have to pick the things that interest you, find out the conferences and publications related to those, and keep up with those as you go through your career. Thank you.